All right. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Where's they say in Japan? Ohio! Everybody good? Yeah, my weekend was nice. Microphone a little close. Sorry, Guy. Cool. Nice. Yep. Yeah, you know what? I bought a new chair. Now, by the way, can you see anything uh, image-wise? It seems like the platform's not showing me any images right now. Can you see the disclaimer? All right. If you can. Okay. If you can. If you're happy, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the disclaimer. Okay, for some reason it's not displaying it to me. All right, cool. So, yeah, I bought a really nice chair uh, over the weekend, and, uh, you know, I love it. It's good, man. Got to have a good chair if you sit in front of the uh, charts for so many hours. I just decided to get rid of it and get a new one. Yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah, it's a fancy pants chair. Weighs 70 pounds. <laughs> I'm like, wow. <laughs> yeah, that that's a chair. So anyways, uh, yeah, it's all good, so I'm pretty happy. I, I only say that because I'm sitting in it, and it's got the lower back support and stuff. I'm like, okay, good. Good, good, good use of money, right? So anyways, let me remind you that trading is risky, not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. So please always stay small, stay humble, focus on the long term, and never risk money you cannot afford to lose. Now I think you can see uh, me, my little business card. I can't. <laughs> it's not showing me images. So, anyways, if you can see me, that's me. My name is Wayne. I'm the chief FX market strategist for Traders Way. We want to earn your business and earn your loyalty. That's why I'm here. So we do these strategy sessions every day, 7:30 in the morning, Monday through Thursday, and every Friday at FXStreet.com, where I am. Forex Speaker of the Year. Thank you very much. And also, the 10th anniversary of Trade Non-Farm Payrolls Live is this Friday. My 120th jobs report in a row. That makes me officially old school, isn't it? Right? <laughs> just old. <laughs> yeah, but seriously, like that. Wow. That, so that's really cool. So um, maybe swing on by and register for that. I'd love to see more than a thousand people. That'd be cool, right? So, anyways, uh, yeah, so see you over at fxstreet.com on Friday. Uh, boom. Oh, I can't even see that. So can you see the desktop now? Tell me what you can see. All right. Good. All right. Nice. Good. All right. We're good with that then. Let me get my draw on tools. All right. Got it going. All right. So you should see uh, USD Yen 4 hour. And there's just the general idea. We had a couple of things going on. We were hypothesizing about places where this could turn up if it was going to turn up. And that was one plan if the BOJ acts, right? Did the, do, did the BOJ act? You bet, act somebody. No, so our other plan was if they don't act, we will be down here. Holy snap. It's kind of neat, right? Do you guys remember doing this? Yeah, cool, huh? All right, now zooming into a smaller time frame on Friday at FX Street, we were saying, all right, we're in this zone here at 107. It could be important. We got trapped in here. I propose that we get long and strong. It comes up. 
retraces as we have planned out here, because remember I drew this before it happened. So the idea, breakout, retracement, long, and jam the stop. How many people were there for that? Okay, cool. The idea was, you know what, it's a long shot. Probably not going to work out. But it might. <laughs> but the trend is super down, right? It's a downtrend. So I actually said you could hedge this with a binary option and reduce your risk by at least 50%. Which ain't a bad thing, right? And, you know, if you see, uh, if you bought around 107-ish, it went up to about 107.40-ish. So, you know, and then it collapsed. That's how it goes. Boo-hoo, right? So now what? Well, I like to watch the key psych levels. So... Let's say you could have been watching 106, which is just in here. Okay. So the, the let's say the medium term trend, or even long term, because it's been all year now, is still to sell the rallies, right? And Technically, that should continue until we break a high, right? That, that means we need to move to 108 before we could even consider at current price levels that maybe there's a change in trend, right? We've got to get back up through that. Or if this makes a lower low, then we've got to get through this area. So, that's that. Don't you think, though, that a higher yielding currency would move first? So you could, like, go Kiwi Yen, right? Well, Sally Pup, it comes down to, like, whether it's truly a carry trade or not, right? So go into maybe the hourly. Okay. And this is an interesting scenario, right? You see this? If you sold there, that was a good trade. You might have lost money, but that would have been a good trade. Now that the 21's broken, we're vulnerable. It's going to go up to the upside, touch the 55. Then what is it going to do? It's going to drop, and then maybe back up. And run into the future 200. Okay. Ryan says double bottom, possible double bottom, like down here, maybe. But I'm going to play it off of this. Okay. What does the four hour look like? Right? Got to be careful in here, and that's where we are now. Cool, huh? Long way to go, sure enough. So you need to decide what. how do you want to play it. Because you could say up to the 21 monthly, weekly pivot cluster, and you're going to drop it like it's hot. Okay, right? But if you're a bull, let's just throw it out there. I'm not saying you should. It's still a high-risk scenario. But M2 
as a bottom predicts M4 as a top. That puts us up at 77 and a half. So it's only 400 pips, but you know. Okay. Okay, and then uh, take a look at the daily. Sort of neutral. Do, 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 do. Right? So again, you have to decide what, how you want to play it. If you are a bear on this, you need to get ready. You understand? This is what I'm telling you. You, you have the bearish move. This is your retracement back to the 5 EMA, back to the pivot cluster. If you're a bear, you need to wake up. Hello? Okay. I can remember everything, but I can't tell what's true or dreams. Deep down inside, I hear my screams. But the terrible silence stops me. All right. So, I'm just going to eyeball that area. On the bullish side, right? The, the bulls are, are thinking, you know, and the bears are thinking just down, 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 right? But if you're going to sell it, sell it high. So there's that move, that's Kiwi. Ozzy's still quite carry ish. Oh, Kevin asked about the previous about hedging with the binary. Is it daily or weekly? It's your call. I mean, you got to still get that right, but one or the other. Yeah. The longer term, the farther out you go, the more risk you take, right? So, you know, usually... You know, in this case, if you're buying on a Friday afternoon, you know, Monday's gap is probably the bigger issue, right? But it also depends on what time frame you made the decision to buy, in which now you need to hedge too, right? So, yeah, so I don't have a straight, you know, straight answer for that, but, you know, you're going to have to think about it. Okay, so this is Ozzy. Okay, and you might remember doing this a while back, but we had a couple of levels to sell and a couple of levels of to buy, and we're we're in one of the buy zones. How cool is that? Right? So you're going to have to make a decision soon, right? Wait for Stokes to roll? Well, you, yeah, you could. But here's the thing. How do you make the Stokes roll? Right? It's just looking at the next three candles. So uh, if this candle closes, let's say, up here, and then 
tomorrow's candle closes like this, your oscillator will look like that. Okay, so yeah, so what you could say is you think it's going to roll up, therefore instead of looking at the daily, you catch a roll on the hourly. And if you get that right, and I call that front running, because your, your plan really is to trade this, but you want to catch it three days earlier. Now the risk is that you might be overly aggressive, but the reward is you should probably be able to jam your stop before you get in any problems on the daily chart, right? Okay, so you're cutting the corner. Because what you don't want is to find out on Wednesday morning you're ready to buy Aussie Yen because this oscillator looks like this, but price is up here. Now you're like, well, I don't really like it at 83.50. I kind of liked it at 80.50, right? The difference being 300. Well, you know, some people throw 300 pips back into the, to the lake or into the river. But some people can live off 300 pips, you know? Freddy Boy says wants a short at 82. Uh, all right, I don't see it on this chart. <clears throat> I can see 83. Uh, what is it, a 50% of yesterday's trading range? Psych level? Yeah, well, okay, well, I don't see it yet. Um, selling it off to 55? Oh, uh, no, well, Ryan, it was oversold. Oops. Okay. Okay. So now you can wait for the next move, which would be up to the 55, down to the future 8 SMA. Oh, I know. I just blew your mind. and then up to the 200. I'm okay with that too. And be, be ready for this to kind of go only down to the 50% and then back up. Gregor said this could drop more. There's no doubt about it. Okay. But, you know, I, I, I just want... So when some, someone says 82, I'm, I'm okay with it. You just got to tell me that it's like the four hour 21. And that in the future, they're going to meet up around 82. Okay. And especially if you say 82 means 82 to 82.20. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. Up, sell, sell, sell. Sure. Yeah, great. Love it. Okay. Because look, this this resistance here is eighty two fifty. So maybe you sell it with a hundred pip stop. I can remember everything. So 82 is the 382. So yeah, so if you said, Wayne, I want to sell it off the 382 Fibonacci retracement. I'm going to use the daily, or sorry, the four hour 21 as resistance, psych level. And, uh, but you know what? That's still, that's 8270. That's, uh, everything says 8250 actually, if, if you really want to get into it. So I've forgotten now who said 82. I'm like, uh, oh, Freddy Boy. You did, Freddy Boy. And now do do to you. 
That's my best Barney Rubble. Uh, I kind of smells like eighty two fifty to me, but Greg went to fifty six in two thousand eight. What's that got to do, got to do with it? So, Greg says it went to 56. So, Greg, um, the, in, the entire money market and credit system globally is frozen? The world is at near panic. End of capitalism as we know it is over. Not quite. So if anything, if, if you just want to dumb it down, if you don't mind me dumbing it down then, why not just like basically look at 80? There's no other reason except it's a big, big fat psych of 80. Somewhere around 80, this finds stability. Okay. Yeah, the world was a much different planet back then, right? And that, that's all um, and that's all I want to talk, say about that, right? Um, so whatever. So what if this goes to 75? All right, fine. Is it going to go to 55? No, no. There's a lot going on in Australia that actually looks quite good on the long run. So I just wrote a paper about uh, what I consider some of the things that Asia should do as a region in regards to regional energy security. And one of them is to diversify heavily out of the Middle East as far as uh, bringing in uh, importing supplies from the Middle East, building a fair and open market where prices do go up and down versus Chinese bilateral agreements in, in Central Asia or in the Middle East or in Africa, right, that kind of stuff, and truly develop an open market exchange mechanism where prices are always based on fair market value. And therefore, if prices are outrageously high because China and India are growing like gangbusters, well, then that would spur initiative and entrepreneurialism to find a way to run the factories more efficiently or build technology to use less energy or to access local energy more effectively, like fracking. You know, that's what happened in the, you know, let's say in the United States when oil went to 200 bucks a barrel. We found a way to get oil and squeeze blood from a stone. We actually literally figured out how to squeeze oil from a stone. That's entrepreneurialism. That's how free market enterprise is supposed to work. Right? But one of the other things I said is if you had a, an open market exchange, and there was a regional strategy, and you needed to diversify your supplies out of the Middle East, wouldn't it be nice if we could start tapping into that gas out of Australia? Because it turns out Australia has more natural gas than the Middle East does. So wouldn't that be nice if we just start developing those technologies so that instead of 3% of China, China's energy and I think even less for India, is based on nat gas, that we get, we get the industry off coal and oil as quickly as possible and start utilizing all that natural gas, which is cleaner anyways. It's exactly what China and India needs. And start sucking it out of Australia. Right? There's less choke points and stuff, that, you know, as far as other risks. So, anyways, that's what I do with my free time. Yeah, good, good paper, dude.
Good job. Yeah, no, Australia has more nat gas now than Qatar, which is just ridiculously amazing. So let's make some money. So here we are in uh, Australia, and, you know, on the long run, I see a lot of money going out of India and China and into Australia. Cool. Yeah, Charles said, will they listen? Well, see, that's the issue. So China goes to places like Africa, and even though they're national oil companies like PetroChina, they're, they're publicly owned companies, right? Backed up, however, by China and its national strategy of oil security. So they go into a place like, you know, uh, Chad or N Niger, not Nigeria, but right next door, Niger, oh, they have some oil. China goes in there and says, hey, why don't we loan you $100 billion? Well, it wouldn't be that much. Why don't we loan you $25 billion? And you pay for the loan with oil. Well, is that PetroChina lending them the money? No, it's like some Chinese bank backed up by the Chinese government. And like, you're going to pay for your loan with oil? So th that's a bilateral agreement, right? So that oil goes straight to China, never enters the market. They probably don't give them a fair price. So it's cheap oil, and it's like a subsidy to China. Now, China gets the oil they need today, but China only needs that today. What does China need tomorrow? China needs clean energy. They need clean skies. I've probably spent three weeks in China over the period of several years, and still have yet to see blue sky. I've never seen the sky in China. Serious, I'm not, and it's not even like it's polluted. It's just, I don't think it exists. <laughs> Has anyone? I mean, I may, I've only been there three weeks, but seriously. I, and I've been there on nice days. So, so anyways, um, so the point is these bilateral agreements short, uh, serve only short-term um, issues, but then what it does is delay the success of what they really need to be doing, and that's their long-term initiatives. Have diversification, have security and stabilization in the entire region so that they can trade with each other, not have animosity. Europe is still kind of working on this kind of stuff, right? But then also to develop better technology and more efficiency and letter less energy in intensity and all these different things. And, and of course, just having a blue sky. But they're delaying their own success, right? So that's what I wrote about it. Short term, but how do you get away from it, right? What would happen if China had to shut, shut all the lights off because they didn't have enough energy? Right, Richard. So, Richard, the only the way I... I suggested that they find these more environmentally friendly ways, but also socially um, friendly ways. And, and what I mean by that is if they had stronger positive relationships in Asia, then that would spur trade and, and other sort of hard to quantify, you know, um, benefits because their trading partners have strong, positive ties. Right? Where, where Asia sits down and says, how can we work together better? How can we share this and share that? Okay, but, but I, you know, I'm a capitalist, so I also think the, the free market will solve a lot of these problems because if oil goes to $300 a barrel, because China and India are sucking it all up, well, then the world, if not them, but the world, someone will find a way. So one of the, uh, so one of the um, things I've been saying is you watch. In the next five years, if oil prices stay around this $40 a barrel, I swear to you, someone on this planet, right, probably in, in, in the U.S. of A, gold, dang it, greatest country in God's planet, right, um, someone's going to find a way to frack oil profitably at 40 bucks a barrel. You watch. 
all we have to do is increase efficiency and improve technology. That's all that's required, time and money, know-how and effort and tenacity. Well, America's got that up the yin-yang. We'll figure it out. Don't you worry about it. Okay? But that's, you know, because we're in a free market system. Right? Or you can try the way that, you know, the Soviet Union or uh, Cuba or Venezuela's done it. Just subsidize and subsidize and subsidize until everyone's dead broke. So anyways, what the hell are we talking about? Oh, yeah, Australia in the long run might be good. Okay, so there's a couple of yens there. And, uh, yeah, you guys want to do beast, I suppose. So, keep in mind, we've been talking for a very long time that the pound is going to get strong again. It's going to surprise everybody. Yeah, what a shocker. You guys see that? Look at the accuracy. <laughs> I mean, at some point, right, you have to realize that people see these things and they trade them. Like, you know, someone pre there, there were people prepared. Isn't it funny? Confirms the double bottom. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, what it means is it's support and it was oversold. Okay? And if you're a bull, you just have to play that. You just have to. Right? You just have to say, well, that is support. And uh, if this opens up around there, I might be interested. And it did open up around there. Okay. So, you know, you, you could very much probably be long around 155. 155 was here, right? And look, we're at 156.5 now. And this thing up opened up at 155. Okay. Is there a possibility that you can get in that and jam your stop? That's what it was about. Right? And then, of course, you can hedge that sucker with a binary, too, if you wanted, right? Okay, look at this, 618 to 1382. Look how it came to 1382 and collapsed. <clears throat> okay. And now, does it continue up? We don't know. Okay, but in these high-risk scenarios, what you do is you take your shot and then take a walk. But this, like I said before, this is basically an exercise of, you know, support and resistance. Okay? And if you're a bull, you should be able to have two or three zones in which you'd consider buying, and you want to take the shot. That's all it is. Okay, nothing heroic. Yes, there's tons of potential of it coming down further. 
Question is, can you buy it, jam your stock, and let it run? Get rid of this. Mm -hmm. What else do you have going on down here? Prior analysis. Yeah, we're starting to see these moving averages cross over. Right? There's a cross here, and the next one's going to cross soon, right? Obviously, these areas are going to be a challenge, right? But if you see this, so if M2 is the bottom, M4 is the top, and this goes from 55 to 163, well, that's not a bad week. Funny thing is, is simply what happened last week. Felipe says, what, take profit, wait for the pullback and try again? Uh, uh, no, I would, I would suggest, because that's just a short-term trade, right? Now you're just a spot trader or a scalper. Uh, I mean, you could, of course. Um, but what I'm suggesting here is it's a long-term trade. So you look to get long somehow, jam your stop at break even, and, and leave it. Oh, a cross of a 2155, usually what you do is you wait for the next Stokes cycle. Let's see if this shows an example. Uh, yeah, well, then in, on this example, it would be in here. Yeah, it's hard because that, that's such a volatile move. We'd have to look at it on sort of more regular scenario. So if you're a bear, uh, look, look at uh, 157, 157.50 for resistance. Well, well, Buzz, let's say you're a bear. You sell when it's overbought. Okay? Not when it's oversold. So this is very neutral at the moment, as you can see. Um, bears should be selling this, right? Right, you guys see that? It's 
It's almost a little bit too late. You should have caught it on a five minute by now. Um, but anyways, there's that. Gold is still moving up. And the interesting thing about gold, now first of all, look at the price action. This worked out really nice last week. Um, the interesting thing about this is that uh, this is not moving like like gold as a, a product. So if you look at, you know, precious metals and base metals and, and metal, you know, like gold is used for dentistry, gold is used for jewelry, gold is used for electronics. So, you know, it's a real commodity. So is lead, so is copper, you know, that, that kind of stuff, right? And the interesting thing is um, those other base and industrial metals are not breaking out like this. So there's an element of the dollars overbought. There's an element of, you know, the first signs of inflation maybe in Europe, at least maybe the beginning of deflation going away, although a strong euro is probably going to kill all that. But, you know, uh, there's a bit of a commodity rally going on and all that kind of stuff. So it's the first sign in a long time for gold um, being a reasonable investment. Um, back down in here, we, we, our, our general guess was somewhere between 1,100 and 1,000. The market would defend the $1,000 line. Turns out it was exactly in the middle, 1,050. Rallies up because the bottom's been printed. Okay, and now it's stabilizing. Cool. And now making another higher high. So it might. It's an. It's interesting to me for the first time in about what six years. Okay, so since this top, I've been a bear. So it's just the first time in a very long time where you're like, oh, well, you know what? It's got some, something going on. Buzz says uh, he's reading somewhere about central banks buying up gold and stuff. Yeah, I don't care about any of that. So um, if, you know, if you like the prices, the, you like the price action, Sure, trade it. But, you know, it, as income around the world picks up, they will buy more jewelry. As, in, as spending around the world picks up, there will be more computer electronics purchased. More people will be able to buy, uh, afford gold fillings instead of lead or whatever that stuff, they, that silver stuff is. Um, you know, just... As, as let's say Japan, which is laughable, but Japan and and Europe and the United States, as they succeed in creating inflation, some people will want to hold gold. As people feel more comfortable to get out of cash positions, you know, I don't know. It's just increase in wealth means an increase in gold. I don't see this as like people freaking out yet about, you know, rampant inflation. But, you know, what I was saying earlier on the way down was no one, no one in their right mind should be going after gold. No one was interested in buying gold. They were interested in yield. And the market over the last, let's say, six months to nine months has really stabilized. Right, and we're starting to see this. the The sentiment since January has changed dramatically, right? But also, isn't this interesting? This could be a Japanese yen chart, couldn't it? Since January, then it weakened for a while. Now yen's super ripper strong again, right? And we got a gold rally.
Pretty cool, huh? So why don't you use this as your alpha? You could say, hey, man, at some point, I think the Bank of Japan is going to get involved. We're going to try to stabilize the Japanese yen around 100, right? Don't you guys think maybe 100, 000, 000 will be a psychological level again and that maybe it gets played? And if so, maybe you sell yen, sell gold. Maybe that's a trade plan. Maybe you could call up all your clients right now and say, hey, get ready, guys. This is a great opportunity. I think over the next two, uh, two months, over the next eight to ten weeks, I think we can look to sell some yen, but also sell some gold. Yeah, thinking ahead, right? Oil. Now, oil is interesting because the higher it goes, the more likely it's going to come down. Do you know how you bring this down? You make the price go up. What will happen is frackers will start fracking, and the media will, will latch on to uh, reports of, let's say, um, Rigs out in the Gulf of Mexico coming back online, boom, that's it. This is not a demand issue. It's still a supply issue. And when price goes up, someone could just flip the switch, a new supply will come on board, and this will come right back down. So that's my thought. Yeah, I think we'll see $30 oil again. I don't see why not. I don't I'm not really saying 25 or 20. But 30 35. Right? And I think I did say that we'd be in a 30 to 50 dollar range for 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 a very long time, right? Isn't that the plan? So we're getting closer to 50, right? We got to 47. So have this come up to 48 and a half and then bring her back down. Well, 50 is a bigger psych level. Oh, I said 30 to 60. Yeah, I can see that too. 60 is, I think, the number that they need to frack. So, but yeah. So I'm just saying, if we're, if we're going to move sideways, then we're going to need down soon, right? So where's the line? Well, we already have the line. So as we get closer and closer to 50, and remember, we touched 47, then maybe we come down to here, let's say. So again, I'm not really saying 25. So I think we should maybe have this one marked then, right? I can remember everything. Terrible silence stops me. S and P five hundred. Seems like we respected our top. Look at the big X I have. <laughs> Don't you just love it? I have this giant X. Remember, I argued with my professor at Harvard about, you know, they teach. They teach, and they've been teaching for 50 years. 
that it's impossible to predict the stock market. And it's all a random walk. And that you can't beat the market. The only way you can beat the market is taking on more leverage and more risk. And I think that all that's gobbledygook nonsense. But what am I going to do? Go to Yale? <laughs> so anyways, yeah, so I drew a giant big X on the left. Guess what? Oh, it came down. Ah, uh, Sam, I'm going to say no to that, but I have nothing against it at all. He's asking about harmonics and stuff. Sure, I, I, I don't, but why not? So, yeah, so random walk. Yeah, look, we hit resistance for... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. We hit resistance for the fifth time, and guess what? Number 25 held, too. Yeah, see, nobody can figure that out. That's too complicated. That, that's just random. So, just funny, huh? How could it be random if it occurred 25 times in the recent past? But I am betting down for the summer, right? We've talked about it. I'm expecting some sideways action for a while. I don't know if it's going to start in May or June, but certainly in August, right? Remember, June's got a lot of uh, central banking meetings that are important. And once we get through that, then, then the Americans take July off, and then Europeans take August off. And then we'll get filthy, stinking rich September, October, November, December. But I, I like August because it's really easy. I don't tend to work 12-hour days in August. But I could sit down for an hour, hour and a half, do my job, pick my lines, and slowly tiptoe into trades, come back a few hours later, move them break even, and have 70% break evens. But the 30% that survive are the beginning of filthy, stinking rich. Not a problem. Namaste, my friend. Oh, Puerto Rican default. Don't know. Right? I don't know who will win. I don't know who will lose. Right? So it's not a, you know, uh, it's not going to be a good thing for anybody, right? And who was it Paulson? One of the big fund managers went in bought a lot of Puerto Rican debt, bought some buildings and stuff like that. But but anyways, yeah, I don't think it's going to be a good thing. Is it going to is it going to make the stock market go up? Probably not. Is it going to make it crash? Uh, I don't know. I, again, I don't know the exact exposure and how bad it is, and, and who's going to be hurt the most, and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, play it if it happens, right? Just pay attention. Open your charts. Sit down in your seat. Bring a, a nice cup of coffee and some snacks, and, and, and stay a while. 
So let's do some commitment or traders report stuff. Can you see this okay? Okay. Slight increase, right? So um, no one bought the euro. Some people got out of their short positions. Okay, so no buyers of euro. Look at that, none. No buyers of euro. Yep, short covering. Right, something's going on here. Hang on, there's an error on the page. Let's go to a different page. Do, do, do. do you guys read these outlooks and stuff? You read Kate's outlook? No comments. So a lot of thoughts written down there, currency by currency by currency. Let's see if this one works. That one works. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty close to neutral on the short side. Big jump in bulls. Charge. Look at that. Big change. People turn bullish. Offset slightly by an increase in bears, but m many more bulls in the market. And that's what we're looking for, right? Many more new bulls in the market. Yen Yen. Slightly less bears. And slightly less bulls, but this may be, I mean, this is delayed a while. So this is before the um, BOJ decision. So I would imagine this is up, but we don't know yet. Okay? But you can see nobody's selling Japanese yen. A little early, right? Little early. That's what we're looking for. Aussie. Okay. Aussie. Look. Buyers, 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 and more buyers. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, over over the last eight to ten weeks eight weeks their buyers have been entering the market and I'd say net change over that period for bears no change at all the water line on this is here okay and we're looking at the net. So this market is heavily bullish. Are you?
Okay. Kiwi. Okay. Increase in bulls. Sideways on bears. Zero lines here. Okay. So in February and March, this market was net bearish. But since April and May, the market is net bullish. Okay. The Kiwi market is bullish. Look, there's no bears. Maybe maybe you buy dips, huh? And kitty cat. This is topsy turvy, huh? We're basically neutral. There's the neutral zone. Okay. The line I'm looking at is this one. So we're we're slightly bullish. But what's actually creating this? Well, th these are bears. So all the selling is over. But this stuff here is bulls. These are buyers, right? Does it seem to be bullish? It's not yield, Joseph. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so um, the Canadian dollar has made it back to neutral. There was heavy selling in January, and it's all faded to zero. So, I don't know if you want to be caught on that one. Right? So, who knows? Because, see here, the, the Canadian dollar strength was based on bears buying back their, their shorts, right? Where's the new strength going to come from? Can you exit? Can you, you know, how many contracts are left if we're here and neutral is here? You see what I mean? There's almost no short contracts open anymore. So, so we either need bulls to buy or we need bears to sell. But right now nobody's doing anything. There, there's actually some... Over the last two weeks, there's been some buying, modest buying. And in that two-week period, no change at all in bears. They didn't get out. They didn't get in. Nobody sold. Nobody got out of their shorts. Nothing happened. A few people started buying. Okay? So if you're, if you're bullish on the Canadian dollar because you're following commodity prices, uh, you're going to want to see some buyers enter the market, right? Right? And going back to 2015, what is this, March 2015? This is the lowest point of short contracts, open short contracts, and we're right there now.
So anyways, uh, calendar. ISM, fine. Chinese PMI, okay, this is going to be a good one. Right, so Asian session today. RBA statement today, an interest rate decision. Obviously good, so this is a good Asian session today. If you're going to stay up to trade Asia, now would be the day. UK PMI, you know, if it's a good number, fine. If it's a bad number, uh, probably get washed out. Because the trend is up, right? Looking at pound dollar and pound yen. Well, I guess pound dollar is much more bullish than pound yen. But anyways. And Aussie jobs, right? Hang on. Just want to confirm. Love to double check. So we got interest rate decision and Aussie jobs. Boy, I don't remember the last time that's happened. I had to double check that that was right. Is it Kiwi? No, unemployment right here, right? Oh, it is. Then what did I click here? Oh, I clicked the wrong one. Thank you. That makes much more sense. All right. So, yeah, so you got the RBA interest rate decision, uh, Kiwi job report. That'll be interesting, especially if you want to be bullish, right? So very, very good Asian session. Wednesday, the big thing is going to be ADP at 8.15, so we can trade that together. That's a great scalp. ISM services later in the day. That's at 10 o'clock, but that's also a good scalp. That's a very tradable one. Okay. Thursday, unemployment claims. Who cares? Okay. Mon monetary policy statement out of the RBA. That's going to be a very nice one. Okay. So that's Thursday afternoon for me. So that's worth trading. So uh, watch the Aussie dollar this week, Abra. Eh, and then, uh, for some reason, NFP didn't make the list, but I'm pretty sure it, there's more to it than just the Canadian jobs report. Friday is also the U.S. jobs report and my NFP 120. NFP 120 at FX Street. Cool, huh? 120. That is quite remarkable. Y'all? Will there be a cake? I don't know. You'd think so. And do you, do, well, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so, and that's that. It's funny, how come it didn't put it in there, though? It's funny. Maybe it's dropped down to only a two-star importance. Still not in there. A couple other things in there. Uh, yeah, European Commission economic forecast. Actually, that's quite important. Uh, more Chinese services stuff. Yeah, you know, anything with China, I would look at it. The trade balance out of Australia, probably not. Um, yeah, I'd go back to the, you know, this, the um, staff forecast, ECB staff forecast. I'd, I'd look at that too. So. And without further ado, I've taken up uh, an hour and more than an hour, hour and uh, 15 minutes of your life. And I know your time is valuable, so I thank you for investing it with me. I hope there was a positive return. 
I'm going to be here tomorrow and the next day and the next day. So uh, it'd be nice if you could swing on by. M remember, uh, spend some time on Forex.today and leave feedback and comments for the analysts. They're real people. They have real thoughts and cares and needs. This is your community. Make it as good as you can. So peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. I'll see you tomorrow. Cheers.